Today on Twin Camp we are continuing our look at the evolution of the British Leyland model range with this 1985 Austin Rover brochure. If you haven't seen any of this series up to now, I'll put a card up in the corner and a link in the description to the playlist. But on to this brochure. We've only moved on three years from 1982 to 1985, but complete rationalisation has finally been achieved, down to just three marks. Austin, MG and Rover, and six models. This brochure was, as you can see, for the Motor Show, which in 1985, I would guess, was held at the National Exhibition Centre, or the NEC, near Birmingham. I probably should have Googled that. Anyway, that, that's not important. As previously, we start with a page of news echoing the launches at the show, but we'll move past that pretty quickly and into the Austin Mini. The Mini externally is almost completely identical to the previous ones, and you can tell that Austin Rover aren't treating the car to much attention by the fact that it only has one page in this entire brochure. In 1984, the Mini celebrated its 25th anniversary, and to celebrate that, Austin Rover launched the limited edition Mini 25. Mechanically, it was no different, but it had 25th anniversary graphics dotted around the car. While this brochure has the little 25 graphic in the corner, there's no mention of the model itself. I'd guess that they'd all gone by this point, so the range was simply back to City and Mayfair. Besides small trim alterations, the Mini had two relatively substantial changes. The most obvious one was the switch to 12-inch wheels. Apart from the 1275 GTs, the Mini 25 was the first to get these bigger wheels, and very quickly the standard car got them too. Underneath those new wheels were disc brakes, which is quite remarkable when you think about it. Yes, this is a 25-year-old car, but for such a popular model to still have drums all around in 1984, it's pretty staggering. More substantial changes were made to the top-selling Austin Metro that had traded places with the Ford Fiesta at the top of the sales charts for a few years, but quickly began to look a little bit basic as Ford introduced the Mark II Fiesta and other newer Super Minis were launched like the Vauxhall Nova, Peugeot 205 and Renault Supervive. 1983 was the Metro's best year and it was all downhill from there. But in late 1984, for the 85 model year, the Metro received a refresh, becoming the Mark II Metro. At the front, a smaller grille and a sloped bonnet aided aerodynamics, although the continuation of the recessed headlamps on poverty models didn't. Another change, and one that Austin Rover was very proud of, but is now a bit of a joke, were the metric wheels. These were not 12 inches, but 315 millimetres. At the time, this was a very logical change, and Austin Rover, as with a few other manufacturers, were encouraged into it by the tyre companies. This was just a part of the wholesale switch to metric instruments. As it happens though, inches weren't a bad form of measurement for something like wheels, so tyres are now completely impossible to find, and everybody just swaps these wheels out for Mark I Metro steels. The smaller grille did slightly modernise the Metro, but that wasn't where it was completely required as the Metro's interior was looking very substandard. In 1980, it was a clever design, but small cars had progressed so much that an all-new dashboard was needed. The old one was little more than a shelf with instruments and a heater bolted on, but that was far too utilitarian. So this fully moulded dash was the way forward, the basic design of which would see the Metro through a major engineering change until its death in 1997. It was a smart design, even in this most chocolatey of browns. There were no real under-the-skin engineering changes, save for a few minor modifications, but there was one rather major body shell change, the introduction of a five-door Metro, massively increasing practicality. The interior of the MG Metro, in my view, lost a slice of the Mark I's attractiveness thanks to the more modern dashboard, but it did gain wonderfully 80s cheese grater alloy wheels. How wonderful are they? Probably the biggest change in the range came in 1983 with the replacement for the Allegro and partially the Maxi as well. This is the Austin Maestro. The Maestro is not a car with a fabulous reputation, but it was fine. Not amazing, just fine. Maestro was a bit of a departure for BL though, moving away from the hydrogas suspension and opting for a much more conventional McPherson strut and torsion beam setup. 
The target was the Volkswagen Golf, and Austin Rover, having faced failure for the last 10 years, just copied the Golf's recipe. That was no bad thing, to be honest, as it produced a car that was much more normal, and they needed this at the time. The actual issue for the Maestro, though, was the world it was introduced to. This project had been started in the mid-1970s, and should have been launched in about 1979 or 1980, before the Metro. But everything was so badly delayed, and the car only came out in 1983, and it showed. The style was just a little bit out of date, and the dashboard was very out of date. Even by 1983, the car still wasn't finished, and the Maestro was launched with an unfinished engine. The 1.6 litre R series was a very light refresh of the E series, allowing the installation of an end-on gearbox, but it was poor. It never really ran right, and this dented the Maestro's reputation before people really got their hands on it. Within a year though, the proper engine, the S series, was finished. But that initial launch was so typical for a company in such a bad way, and it made life for the Maestro ever so difficult. But anyway, on to something slightly more positive. Looking back at it from 2021, this shape just looks so stereotypically 80s, and I love it. It is exactly what you'd imagine the most 80s car in the world to look like. It just needs a Rubik's Cube, a shell suit, and a ZX Spectrum in shot to really double down on the 80s-ness. The standard Maestro came with two engines, the 1.3 A+, and the 1.6 S series. As I mentioned before, both of these engines took an end-on gearbox, finally moving away from the gearbox in sump layout of previous front-drive BL cars. And interestingly, the box itself was a Volkswagen unit. At the top of the Maestro range was a plush Vanden Plas model, as we'd come to expect. But as with the Metro, there was a hot version, the MG Maestro. Originally, this had a twin carburetor version of the R series in the MG Maestro 1600, and you can only imagine how badly that ended. But by 1984, though, they'd done what they should have done from the start, and shoved the 2.0-litre O series in the Maestro, complete with fuel injection, to create the MG Maestro EFI. The injected O series produced 115 brake horsepower, putting it above both the Ford Escort XR3i and the Volkswagen Golf GTI. On the previous page, I mentioned the dashboard, which was quite 70s to be honest, and was made of three different mouldings, causing it to squeak incessantly. This was alleviated later in 1985, though they do seem a little reluctant to show you the dashboard here. The MG Maestro, though, did have the famous digital instruments and the voice synthesizer that would tell you if you hadn't done up your seatbelt or if you had no fuel. This is all very fitting with the early 1980s, with this rapid advance in making cars as technologically impressive as possible. The voice synthesizer was big news at the time, and it was always called upon in marketing for the Maestro. It did get a little bit annoying, though, and was eventually dropped. The Maestro was also really quite practical, as you can see in this picture. Compared to the Mark II Golf that also debuted in 1983, or even more so the Mark III Ford Escort, it seems quite a lot bigger inside. Certainly, there is a big step up between Metro and Maestro, more than you'd expect. And that was, of course, because the Maestro was not the only car to use this platform. The Austin Montego, launched in 1984, was the big rationaliser, partially replacing the Maxi and completely replacing the Atal and Ambassador, rapidly modernising the range at the flick of a switch. All this rationalisation, of course, meant that Austin Rover didn't quite have the penetration into the niches that British Leyland previously had but it was the culmination of a massive scale back of operations in an effort to make a feasible business out of all the former independents that made up BL. As you can probably see, the centre section is shared between both Maestro and Montego, but unlike the Land Crab 3 litre and the Maxi before, the Maestro and Montego were designed with each other in mind to complement each other, achieve brand identity and create some kind of tooling economy. The difference, of course, is the saloon body style and the more streamlined front end, which did deviate from the Maestro's styling somewhat, creating a clear distinction. Apart from those cosmetic differences, the Montego has the same engine choices as the Maestro, and practically the same trim. Austin Rover in the mid-80s had 
pretty much mastered the art of the seat. Not only do the designs look great, but they're all ever so comfy. The dashboard was the main interior difference between Maestro and Montego, and this much more attractive single moulding would be the one the Maestro would receive later in 1985, making the two cars even more similar, and for the better. The Maestro was only available as a five-door hatchback, but the Montego was also available as an estate, for the ultimate load-carrying capability. I did hear at some stage, though I haven't done any research on this so do not trust me, that the Montego Estate was actually more practical than a Volvo 240 Estate. So, if you want to carry all kinds of rubbish, Montego Estate it is. Available as an option were two rear-facing seats in the boot, making the Estate a seven-seater. And although they were meant for children, their primary use, of course, is for somebody to borrow their parents' Montego, place their friends in the boot, and drive down the road making gestures at the cars behind. I'm not saying you should, but you could do that. The final piece in the puzzle of rationalisation was replacing the Triumph Acclaim with the Rover 200. As with the Acclaim, this was a simple rebadging of the Honda Ballard. The Rover did get a couple of touches to make it more theirs, such as the different front bumper, headlamps and grille. The 200 was launched in 1984 and was the first Rover to use this BMW style of model designation that would last until 1999. As this is an early 200, the only engine available is the 12 valve 1.3 litre 4 cylinder Honda engine, the same as the Acclaim. But shortly after this, Rover installed their 1.6 litre S series, providing a much needed increase in performance and even a fuel injected model, producing 102 brake horsepower. The 200 was a strange car all in all, as it was due to slot in above the Maestro and Montego, despite being smaller, because it was a Rover, and therefore it was posh. At this point, the Rover badge still held prestige, but simply rebadging the Ballard as a Rover had interesting consequences. It was actually cheaper than a lot of people thought it was, and so sales increased over time as Austin Rover ran an advertising campaign that emphasised the price of the car. The devaluing of the Rover brand introduced by this model was arguably the start of Rover losing all its credibility. Sure, the SD1 had its issues, but it was still a big V8 executive car. The 200 was a normal car with some nice interior fittings. It is absolutely no coincidence that Richard Bucket drove a Rover 200. If you don't know that show, the title Keeping Up Appearances should tell you everything you need to know about it. This was a car that made people look posher than they were. Despite all this though, the 200 was a good car, especially after Rover introduced some chassis modifications to make it ride and handle better, and these changes even found their way into the European Honda Ballards. It was such a good car in fact, that it ended up outselling Maestro and Montego, though that may have been more a reflection of the reputation gained by the two Austins. Either way, introducing a smaller Rover set a precedent. Finally, we move to the coolest but also the oldest car in the range, again to the Rover SD1. Since the 1982 brochure, nothing's really changed. It's all pretty much identical. While the SD1 by this point had been around for nine years, it had matured beautifully. And while everybody knew it was due replacement, it remained well regarded. These four and six cylinder models had the worst ride, as they weren't the desirable ones. The Rover 2000 was deemed underpowered, and the six pot engines a little bit troublesome. So, as always, the ones to go for were the V8s. And the reason that these models remained so desirable was because they took on a new life through the early 80s. The SD1 went touring car racing and rallying, winning the British Saloon Car Championship in 1984. For homologation purposes, Rover launched a limited run twin plenum version of the Vitesse, while at the same time the Van den Plas gained even more kit and fuel injection. Still, the coolest car on sale in 1985. A 80s Rover, V8 engine, rear drive, manual box, lattice wheels. It doesn't get that much cooler. So, there we are. 
the latest in a long line of BL brochures, and we've finally achieved something approaching rationalisation. The Morris and Triumph marks have been dropped, and though that's very sad, it was necessary in what was always far too complicated a company to succeed. Next time, we'll be moving later into the 80s with a complete change in direction for the group. But for now, thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the video, please do click like and subscribe to Twinkam as well. I'll have more videos coming along soon.